Our call to worship this morning um, is coming from the book of Psalm 103. Let me just read that. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. For who? For he forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. I want to encourage you this morning that as we come to worship, let's forget everything else but just surrender ourselves to God that we can, that he can use us or that we can receive that which he has for us this morning. So I want to encourage you to forget everything that is going on in life, but just focus on this one person who is Jesus, eh? Because that's where we can run to. He's a strong tower. No matter what we do in life, we, we hustle, we try everything. But definitely there is always a point where we just come to a point where you just surrender to someone and say, God, I cannot do it. You're the only one who can do everything in my life. So let's focus and let's grab that thought that God may bless us this morning. Let me um, invite Mrs. Situla to read for us a psalm. Even as we are considering this semester, we're looking at um, the theme, the righteous shall live by faith. And we are looking at the book of Romans. So let's hear from God's word. I'm reading from Psalms 45, verse one to nine. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent man, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Three, grind your sword upon your side, O mighty one. Cross yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victorious in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Five, let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Six. Your throne, O oh God, will last forever and ever. A scripture of justice will be the scripture of your kingdom. Seven, you love, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Eight. All your robes are fragrant with mirror and aloes and cassia. From places adored with, with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. Nine, daughters of kingdom are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal pride in God of Ophir. This is the word of God. Okay, um, let's invite the choir. I'm going to ask Mapalo to come and pray for us as we start this um, uh, praise and worship. But at the same time, I'm inviting the, the praise team to come and help us with some worship. Lord, as we praise and worship your name, may your name be glorified, may your name be exalted and high. Father, Lord, we want to say thank you once more in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
I want to invite everybody to be upstanding as we praise the Lord this morning. I just want to invite um, Pastor Mwanga, is he in? To just um, come and help us do the intercession just for this morning to pray for our needs. We ascribe our greatness to you, our God. Surely we lift up your name because you are worthy to be praised. This morning, Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence as we bring to you, Lord, our hearts, as we bring to you, Lord, even our requests before you because you have said in your word that bring your requests, bring your petitions before the Lord and he will answer you. This morning we want to pray for students who have lost their loved ones. We have lost parents, grandparents, friends and brothers and sisters. We pray for your strength, 
because you are the only source of comfort. Comfort them and strengthen them, Lord. We pray, Father, that you touch them and you encourage them in your own special way. And this time, Lord, as we come just near the quizzes, the tests, we pray for our students, we pray for our members of staff, we pray for the entire process of the quiz and tests, committing it in your hands. We pray that, Lord, that you help our students to apply themselves. You will help them, Lord, to work hard. Equally, Lord, the faculty, Lord, you give them the strength, the impetus even to work hard as they prepare. Give them the strength which they need. We thank you, Lord. And we pray, Father, for the weekend. We pray for your protection upon each one of us. We pray, Father, that you keep us safe. You keep us in the bosom of your presence, Lord. Thanking you and blessing you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. The theme for this semester is the righteous shall live by faith. And we have been looking at the book of Romans. And this morning, our topic is God's case against all godlessness and wickedness of man. Why God shows wrath. May we just invite Reverend Shamtea as he comes to feed us with the word of God. Thank you for the opportunity to just, you know, share the word of God and encourage one another this morning as we run through uh, the book of Romans. You know, the background to the book of Romans has already been given to us, wonderfully done by Dr. Zimba and Dr. Mary Belt upon that and uh, Brother Msonda Mlenga, you know, last week, you know, blessed us greatly by you know, sharing from two verses that summarize uh, the overall theme for this particular book of Romans. And so the writer Paul begins writing this particular epistle by introducing himself as he does in his other epistles to other churches. And strangely, you know, he introduces himself not just as an apostle, but also as a doulos of Christ or a slave of Christ. You know, meaning he has no rights of any kind at all. He has to do it. You know, he exists for his purpose. He cannot do any other thing apart from preaching the gospel. And that's why he introduces himself as the slave of Christ or in Greek, the doulos, you know, of Christ. And so his heart and passion is to share the gospel. And he knows that the gospel is a need for all humanity. You know, Jews and Gentiles alike, they need the gospel, without which they are all doomed. And so he stresses the need for the preaching of the gospel. And his desire and intention to visit the Roman church, he has never been there before, but his intention is that he may visit this church and share the gospel even more and share the gospel even more and so in verses 1 to 7 you know we see the greeting and verses 8 to 15 we see that he presents thanksgiving and then verses 16 and 17 summarizes you know the overall theme of this particular great epistle and so we pick it up from there by looking at verses 18 to 23 today. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. I read ahead of you. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what 
has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Let's pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to hear your word. We pray, Lord, speak to us today. Let your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So we look at this particular, you know, passage, you know, this morning, and as we have already, you know, heard, the overall theme for this particular book is the righteous shall live by faith. But today we look at the title, God's Case Against All Ungodliness and Wickedness of Men. And of course, you know, the term men being used in a generic sense to refer to both male and female. And why God shows rough. Verses 18 to 23. Now, as we look at this particular passage, the Apostle Paul shows that God is against all ungodliness and wickedness. God is against all ungodliness and wickedness. And he shows wrath because of the same. So as we look at this particular you know, passage, the first thing that we see in verse 18 is the wrath of God. And the Apostle Paul says a number of things about this wrath of God. Firstly, we need to understand that the wrath of God here is a reference to the anger of God that is righteous and just and good. It refers to God's anger that stands against sin, against evil, against violence, against slaughter, against immorality, and against all injustices that happen among, among human beings. And so this is what the wrath of God is in this particular uh, passage. And so if he's talking about the wrath of God in that sense, then it does not just apply to the context that the Apostle Paul was speaking to. It also applies to our context today. Because the things are very much, you know, a, a reality among us. Sin is very much a reality today. Evil is very much a reality today. And so we see so many injustices among, among human beings today. And so the wrath was not for then, it is also for today and for the now. And so this is what the Apostle Paul talks about. And so as we look at the wrath of God in this particular passage, there are three things that we need to note. The first thing is that the wrath of God is a reality. It is a reality. It says the love of God is being revealed. It is a reality. It is not exaggerating. It is not telling a story. It is not assuming something that is not, that is not there. You know, it's not simply an assumption. It's something real. So that's the first thing. God's anger is real. It's there. And, and so he, he wants to awaken them to that fact that it's there. They need to be aware. And so the second thing is that God's wrath is revealed from heaven. From the very throne of God. The wrath is revealed. This anger is revealed against humanity. And there are reasons why God reveals his anger against humanity. It is revealed. Already from the psalm that was read, we heard that God loves righteousness and hates wickedness. And the third thing that we see in this particular verse is the subjects of God's wrath. The subjects of God's wrath. 
And when we look at the subjects of God's wrath, we see two classes of people here. The first class is that of ungodly and wicked human beings. That's the first class of people here. And so he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And so there are two classes of people here. The first class is that of ungodly and wicked people. Ungodly and wicked people. And the word ungodliness here or godlessness is the Greek you know, as a bear. And the Greek word as a bear simply means failing to love and obey God. Failing to love and obey God. And not being like God. And not desiring to develop the God-like character. That's what it refers to. And the word wicked is the Greek word adikeia. And it simply means failing to love others and treat others as you should. And so it refers to acts against others. And acts against others may involve cheating, stealing, lying, abusing others, enslaving others, destroying others, taking advantage of others. That's how the word wicked is used in this particular te text, this particular context. And so it's not just for then, even for now, how do people treat their fellows? How do people treat one another? Do people still look down upon others? Do people still teach, still lie, still steal, abuse others? And so on and so forth. So that's the first class of people here. And so God is against such. His anger is against such. Those who do not love God and obey God. And those who do not love and treat others as they should. That's the first class. Then the second class that we see in this particular verse is that of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. In verse 18b. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And to suppress is simply to hold down, to repress, to stifle, to hinder, to, you know, that's what it means. But how do they know the truth that they suppress? And this is what we see in verses 19 and 20. How they know the truth which they suppress. The first thing is that this truth is about God himself. The truth is about God himself. That's the first thing. And then secondly, we see how they have come to know this truth. What are the sources of this truth? The first is that the source of truth is the very human mind. The inner being, the conscience, the inner person appeals to them, tells them something about God. They have a conviction within themselves. They can know God from within. The way God has flamed them, the way God has made them. There is something within them that is conscious of God. That he is there. He exists. There is someone above all and above everything. There is something within them. Even before the revelation of God by scripture. Already the God has placed something within them. That appeals to them. That there is someone. This is how they know about God. So from within. They are reasoning. They are thoughts. And so they reject their conscience and thoughts and reasoning about God. They reject that. Even if their thoughts are telling them, their minds are telling them there is someone, they decide to reject that. What do you think about God? Does your mind tell you something that there is someone above, someone supreme, the most high? Does the inner being appeal to you? Are you conscious of God that he exists? He is there and he is real. And so we see that, you know, what they need to know about God is evident to them. 
is made clear and plain to them. And so within people's minds, people's hearts and consciences, it is made plain and clear by God himself. What God desires that they know about him. And may this be real to you. May this be real to me. What we need to know about this God. And so we see in verse 19 saying, you know, God has shown or made it plain. He has made it evident and clear. He has made these things clear to man. Of course, we cannot know everything about God, but there's a great deal we can know about him. Job says we cannot know everything about God, according to Job chapter 11, verse 7. But there is also a great deal that we can know about God. And Hebrews 11, verse 6 says even demons know that God exists. Even demons know that ex- demons know that God exists. Though they are evil, they know that God exists. And God desires that we may know him and confess him. He exists. God exists. And so we can know God from within. But sadly, man chooses not to know God. You know? And yet that truth is within man. That truth is within each one of us. But we can decide not to know God. We can suppress that truth and continue with our own wickedness. Continue in our own evil ways as if the moral God does not exist. As if the holy God is not there. As if God is an absent landlord who leaves his property in the hands you know, of a tenant. And he does not see what the tenant is doing with his property. God is not like that. God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. God is all-present. And God is all-powerful. And whatever man does, God is not blind about it. God knows everything. And he observes everything. And that's why he reveals his wrath, his anger against all wickedness and ungodliness. And so we see here the first reason why God reveals his anger. It's because man, you know, is so wicked and evil. And because of wickedness, God reveals his anger from heaven. So this is what we see in this particular passage. And so what they need to know about God is plain, is clear. They know God from within. And how do they know God? The second way of knowing God is from nature in verse 20. In verse 20. Nature declares the greatness of God. Nature declares the greatness of God. And so when we look at nature, the created order, how God has flamed the created order. You know, we we look at the sun, the moon, the stars and everything, including our fellow human beings, the way God has flamed us. It speaks to us something about this great God who brought this nature into existence. It speaks about his qualities, his greatness. So nature speaks about God. And so the only living and true God shows wrath because men reject what nature reveals about God. Nature reveals something about God. Theologians refer to this as general revelation. So God has revealed himself in a general way to all human beings through nature. And so as we observe nature, and as you scientists study nature, don't take nature to take the place of God who brought nature into existence. As we start nature, at times we look so powerful by the knowledge that we get through empirical research. And we tend to think we are more knowledgeable than the owner of nature, than the one who brought nature into existence. And good science knows God. Good science honors God. Good science glorifies God. As the all-knowing God, we know little and he knows all. No matter how much research we may do, no matter how much scientific discovery we may come up with, no one shall reach the level of God knowing all things. He's the only one who is all-knowing. We only know a bit. He knows it all. And he must be honored. He must be glorified. 
And so even in our learning, it doesn't matter how many degrees we may acquire. We may be called doctor so, professor so. Come on, we must humble ourselves before the whole knowing God. Nature speaks about God. So creation reveals God. The whole universe, the whole universe, its praises, its nature declares God. It declares God's eternal power as the supreme intelligence. God is the supreme intelligence. And so when you discover medication for COVID, for tuberculosis, for HIV, AIDS, don't think you are superstars. There is a supreme intelligence. It is a supreme intelligence and force, that energy that brought nature into existence. Nature reveals God's divine nature, his deity. He is a God who cares and provides. He cares and he provides for what he has created. He does not leave the creation or nature to sustain itself. He sustains the nature himself. That is the nature of God. He cares, he provides. He gives life. And he has interest in life. He has interest in life. And so we look at life as a gift and a precious gift from God. And God is interested in the life you have. He is interested in the life that I have. Because he is the giver. He regenerates and replenishes. And carries the things on. And so things continue existing. Because he is in charge. He is in control. And so he deserves worship. He deserves obedience. How else can we know God? For you and I, we are more privileged than the audience that the Apostle Paul wrote to, than those of time past, because we have a special revelation from God, which we call specific, you know, special revelation, the written scriptures. They didn't have the scriptures then, but we have the scriptures now. And so we are more privileged. We are able to read the scriptures and get to know what the scripture says about this God. We can know God better than them. Because God has revealed himself in a special way through the written word. And not only that, he has revealed, revealed himself through the man, the God man, Jesus Christ, who came and dwelt among us. He lived among us. He revealed God when he came on earth. That we may know God better. And so we can know God from scripture today. And so man is not without excuse according to verse 20, verse B. Verse 20 B. Man is without excuse. Man has no defense to give. Man has no answer, no reason that can justify his rejection of God. We cannot justify our rejection of God. There is no reason we can give. There is no answer we can give. There is no defense we can give. Why? Because God has shown and made it clear everything that he wants us to know about him. And so we have no defense. And so God reveals his anger. And so we see here the second reason why God reveals his anger is because men reject what nature reveals about God. And so as we start nature... We start nature with the goal, the ultimate goal of knowing this great God who created nature. That should be the ultimate goal of studying nature. It's not just to know about nature and how, you know, how the world revolves and so on and so forth. If it spins, that knowledge is important. But we must know the one who made what spins and have a relationship with it. The third reason why God shows his wrath of anger is that men do not glorify him nor give him thanks. Verse 21. For although they knew God, his past tense now, and the apostle knew, knew the, the first century world very well. And that's why he writes, for although they knew God. He uses past tense. He knew the first century world very well, the pagan world, he knew it very well. John Stott you know, one of my favorite writers, 
you know he has written a lot on preaching and other uh, and other and other areas of study as well in his one of his books on preaching he says a preacher must have a bible in his right hand and a newspaper in his left and so the bible provides the text and the newspaper provides the context and so you need to understand the context the environment so that the text which is scripture can be relevant to the context. Otherwise, you'll be speaking on top of people's heads instead of speaking to people's hearts. And so we see here then that, you know, God shows his anger because men do not glorify him nor give him thanks in verse 21. Verse 21 says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. They can see that God is great, quite well. And they can see that God is good. But they did not glorify him, meaning they did not worship him. They did not obey him or save him as, as God. They did not give thanks to him. They did not praise, magnify, or express appreciation to God. How is your life? Do you honor God daily? Do you give God the worship that he deserves? Do you magnify him in your day-to-day -day life? Do you show appreciation to God in your day-to-day -day life? Do you thank him for who he is, for his goodness, for his faithfulness, for his mercies that endure forever? Do you thank him for his grace, even the grace that has brought salvation, for without which we are doomed? Do you thank him enough? Do you give him honor? We see here that there are two severe consequences of pushing God out of people's minds. There are two consequences here that we see of pushing God out of people's minds. And when we push God out of our minds, there is disaster. And it happened in the 17th century during the era of enlightenment you know, and when people returned to classics, the study of languages, and, you know, the discovery of science, and man took the center of the universe and removed God from the center of the universe, and so the universe became man-centered instead of being God-centered. And from that time, we started losing absolute truth, and scripture is absolute truth. And today, people will tell you that truth is relative. What is true to you may not be true to me. I have to decide on my own what is true to me. You can't tell me what is true. And that is the world today. And that is the world today. You can't tell me what is true. I have to decide on my own what is true. What is true to you may not be true to me. Truth is relative. And that's why people have lost the respect for the inspired scripture as the word of God. They have lost the respect and honor for the word of God. Because truth can be anything now. No more absolute truth. Truth can be discovered on your own. And yet God has revealed this truth in the written scriptures. And so there are two, senses, two severe consequences of pushing God out of people's minds. The first consequence is that men's thinking became futile. That's what we see in this particular passage. Their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so the word futile here means empty. It means senseless. It means worthless. It means unsuccessful. And so we see there that their minds are void and empty of God. So people may have all the knowledge in their heads, but without God in their minds. God is not in their thoughts. And we can see in social media, whatever people post, you can see what goes on in their thinking. And if there is anything that the enemy works on so hard to win, is to win the mind of a human person. Because he knows the moment he wins your mind, you are doomed. You are under his control. Scripture says, as a person thinks, so he is. We become what we think. And if you lose your thinking, you lose yourself in totality. You become nothing. 
And this is maybe something that we are going to look at on Monday during the Youth Day. For those of you who have registered the Students Monday we are meeting, there's a wonderful program and event for you. We want to talk about the mind and other things. You know, very, very critical. And at your stage, that's where you lose your mind. <laughs> Young as you are, you lose your mind, you become something else. And you are imaging adults. And imaging adults, if they lose their mind, what kind of adults will they become? And these are the leaders. These are the honorable ministers of tomorrow. These are the His Excellence of tomorrow. If they lose their mind, what kind of His Excellence shall we have in the few years to come? You can tell by the way they dress that they have lost their mind. Something is lost in their mind. When I meet them with their trousers down there, I pull it up. Come on, restore your mind. Your mind is empty. You need God in your mind. You need God in your thoughts. And then this young lady looks at this. Will this be my husband with the trousers here? And everything exposed. What kind of husband? And what kind of dad? God is not in their thoughts. The second you know, consequence we see of pushing God out of people's minds is man's foolish heart is darkened. In verse 21b, their foolish hearts were darkened. And you know, when people's, mind, people's hearts are darkened, they are blinded, meaning they are unable to see. They cannot distinguish the right from the left. And this is what we see. People who post naked and post on social media, and people begin to make comments as if they are heroes and heroines. That's nonsense. They need to honor their bodies. They were made in the image of God. Everything about them must bring honor to God. And so they suffer empty thoughts and, and darkened hearts. They are blinded, they can't see. Even when the gospel is preached, the light of the gospel cannot enter their hearts because they are darkened. They cannot see the light of the gospel of Christ and they repent and turn to God. The fourth reason why God shows wrath. We see it in verses 22 to 23. Verse 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. And so we see the fourth reason here. God reveals his wrath. He shows his anger because, you know, men became prideful and turned away from him. That's what we see here. So men claim to be wise. They replace God with something else. They replace God with something else. And men exchange the immortal God for some mortal idols. They forget that God always has been, God always will be, he is eternal. This God is eternal. They forget that. They swap God for the image. They swap God for the idea. <laughs> the world of theories, <laughs> scientific theories. Eric Erickson said so and so. Wonderful. They use their minds well to discover all the things about how humans, you know, develop the social, the psychosocial development theories. They are wonderful theories. About how we develop as human beings. But all those theories should, their ultimate goal should be to exalt God. He must be exalted. The thought that man is his own God. And so humanism here takes the place of God. Those of you that are old enough, who were there during the time of Kaunda, you agree with me, the humanism of KK those days, may easy so rest in peace. And those days when we were in primary school, in the 70s, we were in school, and, you know, KK and his team, whenever they were going across the country, they could sing to the growth of KK. And not to the glory of God. And they could say, Kumulu Lesa, Pashi, Kaunda Namangwe. In heaven, God on earth, Keke and Kwacha. So Keke was a God on earth. And God, a God in heaven. On earth, it was Keke who was a God. That man was so powerful. May he so rest in peace. 
I remember those days we could queue up waiting for him when he was visiting in Wansha those days. We could queue up waiting for him the whole day up to afternoon there so when he shows up with a white handkerchief. Chisokone, chisokone, chisokone. Humanism. Humanism takes the place of God. It makes make their own God. It makes their own God. Humanism makes an idol out of man and worships man as the God of his own destiny. I have to decide my own destiny. <laughs> so you become a God to yourself. You can't decide your own destiny. <laughs> you can only become what God has ordained you to become. And that's what you need to seek and find. You have to discover it. What is it that God has ordained me to become? And so this is what humanism does. And this is usually the scene of scientific and industrialized societies. Scientific and industrialized societies. They have pushed God out of the sea. Man has taken the center. Man has become his own God. We can solve all our problems through scientific research. <laughs> but when hurricanes come, do we solve them? <laughs> Are we able to handle them? We discover through science that a strong wind is coming from Mozambique. You know, there are floods in Mozambique and they are coming towards Zambia. Do we find solution within our small brains? No. It shows that God is, so, is sovereign. God is powerful. There are things we can do within our limitations. But, and there are certain things we can't do. Only God can. And so images of men and animals, we see, you know, them now coming up with idols. Images of men and animals and birds. These are humanistic gods. The worship seen in non-industrialized and non-scientific societies. This is the worship we see. So many idols everywhere. And the Apostle Paul, as he goes to the Gentile world in Acts chapter 17, verse 29, he talks about it. He talks about it. And so in all this, then we see that God is justified by showing his anger against mankind, against humanity. We cannot take his place and replace God with something else. Can we replace God with cash? Those days we had three C's. One C for the car, another C for cash, another C for the cell phone. I don't know now. Can we replace God with ideas, with thoughts that we are our own God? And finally, as I conclude, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Verse 5 says, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. And so God's wrath for judgment is progressive. There is a day when the final judgment of God shall be, shall be faced. And it shall be faced because people have refused to repent even after hearing the truth. They have heard the gospel, but they have remained stubborn. They don't want to repent. They don't want to change their ways of life. And so God's final judgment is promised. It is a reality. It is assured. May this be the time to search our hearts. May this be the time to seek God. And seek to honor him in our lives. God bless you. Thank you so much. been so clear and I hope every everyone has taken something from the message and just a few reminders just to few takeaways this morning from God's word the gospel is for everyone but only those who believe in him who receive the gospel. God who is holy, holy is against wickedness and godlessness. God's wrath is God's anger and it is a reality. Why God reveals his wrath and anger. 
because God has revealed himself to all mankind. Because God's nature speaks about him. Because human beings know his greatness, but they do not glorify him. They reject him and cannot obey him. Because men have become proud and turn away from God. And in all these things, God is justified for taking his anger. God's judgment is coming. Amen? Amen. May I um, ask uh, Pastor Mugala to just close for us in a word of prayer? Uh, shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity that we can gather in this manner. Lord, we want just to thank you for the bread that we have partaken with regards to your word, O oh Lord. It is my prayer that, Lord, as we have heard your word, may it sunk into our hearts, and may we practice it, and may we be aware of the great wrath of you, God. Father, I pray that, God, we will succumb to your word. We will take heed to your word. We want just to thank you that, Sovereign Lord, you continue speaking to each one of us and convincing us through your word and through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, even as we come to the end of our chapel today, we are excited to say thank you, God, and committing the rest of the day into your very hands. May your name be glorified and be honored as we continue the rest of the day with our various tasks. We pray this in the blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ and Savior. Amen and amen.